Welcome to this lecture in the ongoing series of lectures in real analysis. Today we will be starting a new module. I had intended to get into actual real analysis business uh, with this lecture but then I decided to sneak in this extra module which is about very general stuff that one should know. Uh, it's basically about you know functions between sets. So injective functions, bijective functions, cardinality, etc. We'll we'll look at we'll look into that in detail. So today's uh, business is about this particular theorem, which I will get into. But before that, let us briefly recall some basic notions that I have been using uh, implicitly so far. But it's good to recollect. So now, just suppose you you have a function from a set x to a set y, just any function. We say that that function is injective if whenever two things have the same image, x1 and x2 have the same image, the two things are actually the same. So no two distinct things can map to the same point. Pictorially, if this is x and this is y, then whenever you pick two different points, this kind of thing does not happen. If this is, let's say, f, then these two different points cannot map to the same point. This does not happen. When, when that's the case, we say that the function is injective. Another concept is surjectivity. So we say that f is surjective if every point in y is achieved as the image of some point in x. So again, suppose this is our picture, then whenever we, whenever we pick a point here, little y, there is something here which maps to y. There may be multiple such things, but it, there is at least one such thing. So everything in the target is covered. That's basically surjectivity. We say that f is bijective if it is both injective and surjective. So by a bijective function essentially identifies x with y. It's just changing the names of things in x and renaming them so that they look like things in y. It's it's a set theoretic isomorphism, if you know what that means. Otherwise, forget it. So that's bijection. Uh, and another concept which we keep using is the image of a subset of the domain. So this is called the domain. Uh, this is the domain of the function. This is also called the codomain. Or I prefer to call it the target. So suppose we are given a subset of the domain, then the image of that particular subset under F is this set. Basically, the images of all points in A collected in a set. So again, pictorially, suppose this is X, this is Y, and this is A, then you just take all the all the all these things, and this is now image of A under F. Okay, and the pre-image of a subset B, this is a subset of Y, sorry, this is a subset of Y, is defined as, and this is just a notation, this is not to say that F is invertible or anything, this is just a notation to mean this, meaning all those points in X whose image lies in B, that's the pre-image of a subset, so again, if we have this image X, and sorry, in this picture, and this is B, then all those points which map into B are, I mean, th this thing is notated as this and it's called the pre-image of B. The pre-image of a singleton is, n is written like this instead of the more descriptive, instead of this we use that, so it's just another piece of notation. And lastly, the composition of two functions. So suppose we have a function from x to y, x and y are sets, and another function from y to z, then we can go this way. And this thing is called the composition of g and f, and it's written this way. Basically, when we pick little x, it becomes f of x, and under g, it becomes g of f of x, or maybe you want to write it this way. This is also written as g of f of x. So that's the definition of composite of two functions, a very natural definition. All right, so that's that. And now let us state and prove the cantor schroeder bernstein's theorem, which states the following. So let f from x to y 
be an injection uh, or rather we have two injections the one from x to y and the other from y to x so suppose x and y are set such that there exist two injective maps one going from x to y the other going from y to x and the theorem says that then there is a bijection There is a bijection from x to y. So it says something quite profound. So if you can kind of embed x into y and embed y into x, then actually you can identify x and y. So that's that's a very fundamental theorem. And we'll prove this. So let us first see some intuition as to what is the idea of the proof. There are there are many many proofs of this. I'm just going to present one of them. Uh, this proof. Let me also give a reference. I saw this proof on the art of problem solving. This this website. It's a, it's a great resource. There are a lot of things there. This is uh, so the proof that I'm going to present is is the one I saw here. It's a very short and neat proof, so I chose it. Uh, but again, I encourage you to think about this theorem before even looking at the proof because it's such a fundamental thing, and one should at least get a feel for it before uh, getting into the gory details. But let me try to give an in give some intuition as to how you know this this particular proof goes. So. <clears throat> So here I have made the diagram here you have this function f going from x to y so what it is doing is it's mapping whole, this whole thing here and this is an injective function by hypothesis okay so this function does this, this function sh falls short of being a bijection by just the fact that it is not having anything here in the image so, so this is this function is not a, if if this were a bijection then we are done uh, meaning if if this were a surjection then we are done so so let's say it is not a surjection just in uh, so that uh, we are considering the adverse case so these are all the points that are not in the image of f okay so we'd like to fix that and here is a natural attempt so we take uh, so these are the points that are not in the image of f let me shade them by a certain color okay these are not in the image of f okay something i mean i haven't shaded it very properly okay uh, so how do we get them in the image of not f but some other function which we construct out of f and g so what we already have is we have a map in the other direction which is g which is also injective so it takes all of this all of this this thing here and let me shade that also so suppose this is the image of this portion under g this ring sh I have made it in, in a ring shape because this is a ring shaped thing. So if you hit by a G, you, you get that. This thing becomes that thing under G. So what we would uh, naturally try to do is, okay, fine. G is already identifying this much with that much. So perhaps we can just, we can define a new function from X to Y, which takes all of this to all of that via the inverse of g restricted to this much i mean if you if you just restrict to this much all of these points are uh, you know you you can feed any of this point to g g inverse so what i'm trying to say is for every point here there is a unique point here which maps to that because g is injective so i'm just saying reverse that arrow so you, you when you when you pick a point here you just go via g inverse now the g is not invertible but still all of these points 
one can talk about the inverse of g so i hope you I hope you get that so all of these points will send via the the inverse of g and the rest of the points will just we will do to them what we were doing to them earlier basically we'll just push them via f but that runs into a problem because now we do achieve all of these points in the image of this new function but this new function misses some of the points namely which points it misses it misses now the image of this ring under f which i have drawn like this so note that the entirety of this thing is going here inside so this ring shape thing will also go inside that and again i have depicted that as a ring shape thing here in a, in a different color so now we have a problem here so this this is precisely the 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 part that is not there in the image of this new function so what we'll do is we'll just keep playing this game now we can push this thing again by g it will have some image and note that since this and that are disjoint the image of this under g will be disjoint with that so it will be one can suggestively draw it like this and then continue the same same process so with this one can write down a proof but the way it is expressed in in this on this website is is a very neat expression of the same proof so let me now get into the details of the proof so here is the proof okay so we have a definition which we need for this proof so let us call a point y in y lonely if it is not in the image of f if b does not belong to the image of f so these are all the lonely points the red ones this is these, these are all the lonely points so just give me a second yes, we have defined lonely points okay all right uh and we say y prime in y is a descendant of y in y now i'm not saying that y is lonely or anything it's just just some arbitrary point so y prime is a descendant of y if there is some whole number such that y prime is equal to this thing which i should explain what that means so what do i mean by this notation this just means f composed with g composed with f composed with g composed with dot 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 f composed with g n times so this is a total of n times right and when n equals 0 because n is allowed to take the value 0 we just by convention let it be the identity map so f composed with g to the power 0 of y would be just y so in particular every point is a descendant of itself okay so that's that's just two pieces of definition and now we'll define our map so define a map h from x to y as h of x equals g inverse x if f of x is a descendant descendant of a lonely point and 
simply f of x if well otherwise so i mean i i hope you're you're getting what does this have to do with our uh, intuitive idea here so you go via g and then you go via f so these are your descendants of lonely point but then you continue the process so, so that's what that's what that's why you have this n fold composition n could be anything right so i hope you can draw the parallels between the, this writing and that picture and uh, i hope you also understand this because if uh yeah so i i need to need to explain that this is a legitimate thing to do basically what i want to want to say is that whenever fx is not a descend uh, whenever fx is a descendant of a lonely point it is legitimate to consider this meaning x is in the image of g only then you can talk about this if x is not in the image of the image of g this is a meaningless thing so that's what that's what we need to justify uh and also i will write this simply as dlp descendant of a lonely point will be simply referred to as i mean abbreviated as dlp so we want to show that if fx is a dlp then x is in the image of g right which let me expand this image of g means g of y y and y okay so this is what we want to show because only then this makes sense all right so suppose it is uh, so if fx is indeed a dlp then fx equals f composed with g the n fold composite of y for some whole number and some y in y which is lonely so so for some and some lonely little y in capital y so just by the fact that little y is lonely this cannot be zero because if this were zero then it would have fx equals y but then y is not lonely by definition the lonely points are those which are not in the image of f so this is a uh, this is a positive integer so i'll just write that so thus n is a positive integer meaning a natural number and therefore uh f of x is f of g of f composed with g to the power n minus 1 y i think one more bracket is needed so i can't i can never tell no this is fine so by the injectivity of f this means x equals g of something whatever that something be i mean we explicitly know what it is but basically this says that x is indeed in the image of g image of this uh, this particular point so this is fine so the, the, this guy is well defined and uh, the rest of the proof is basically showing that h is a bijection so before we get into that there is a little claim that we need to settle so here is the claim let x in x then hx is a dlp if and only if fx is a dlp and here is the proof so first assume that fx is a dlp
then by definition what is hx hx is g inverse x that's how we defined h and since uh, fx is a dlv uh, there is a lonely point little y uh, and a whole number such that fx is f composed with g and fold y okay but then again, as we noticed earlier, n is actually a natural number because y is lonely. So, so I'll use the fact that uh, this guy is actually a natural number. And that gives, that gives, which implies x is g of f composed with g n minus 1 y which implies g inverse x equals, okay, wait a second, g inverse x is f composed with g and minus one fold composite of y, this bracket, yeah. All right, uh, but then, g inverse x is, a descendant of a lonely point, meaning this, this particular lonely point. This is a whole number, because n is a natural number, this is a whole number. So this implies that g inverse x, which is nothing but by definition hx, is a DLP. Right? So that's that and for the converse direction now assume hx is a dlp then hx equals f compose g and y for some n in whole numbers and a lonely point and y in y uh, y a lonely point okay so if fx were not a dlp So this is what we want to show. We want to show that fx is a DLP. So if, if on the contrary it is not a DLP, then by definition of hx, this is equal to fx. And thus, fx equals this thing, which implies that fx is a DLP. So that would be a contradiction. And uh, therefore fx must be... Uh, DLP. It's a pretty simple claim. And now we can show that H is indeed injective and surjective. So first let us show that it is surjective. So H is surjective. So to do that, let y be an arbitrary point and we'll show that there is some little x such that hx is y. So there are two cases, either y is a descendant of a lonely point or it is not. So case one, uh, if y is a DLP, then 
so is f composed g of y right that's immediate from the definition of dlp and thus h of g of y okay so let me let me write this as f of g of y right uh, is is a dlp so if y is a dlp then so is this but as we just noticed if this is a dlp if this is a dlp therefore by the previous claim h of g of y is also a dlp that's what the previous claim gives okay uh, Actually, we don't need to use that. Okay, forget about this. So we have that this guy is a DLP, and therefore, thus, f of sorry h of g of y is g inverse of g of y. That's by definition of h. If f of anything is a DLP, then h of that anything is g inverse of that. So this is equal to y. And we have shown that an arbitrary point y which we chose, if it were a DLP, it is actually in the image of h. So the case that we now need to consider is that, that y is not DLP. So assume y is not a dlp okay so then y itself is not lonely because every point is a descendant of itself if y were lonely, then it would be a descendant of a lonely point. Alright. Uh, thus, there is some x such that fx equals y and now by definition of h, therefore, Uh, by definition of H, we have H of X is F of X. Why is that? Because F of X is not a DLP. So by definition of H, H of X is simply F X, which is Y. And we have shown that Y is indeed in the image of H. So, in any case, either y is a DLP or it's not, uh, it's, it's in the image of H and therefore H is surjective. And lastly, we want to show that H is injective. And here is how we do it. So, let x1 and x2 in x be such that hx1 is equal to hx2 and we want to show that x1 equals x2 okay so again we'll consider two cases uh, we will consider two cases like previously So 
So case one is that assume f of x1 is a DLP. So then so is h of x1 by the first claim which is nothing but h of x2 by, hypo by, by our assumption and hence f of x2 is also a DLP. Again by the first claim. So, so with, with that information, h of x1 is g inverse x1 because f of x1 is a DLP and h of x2 is g inverse x2 because f of x2 is a DLP. And now by the equality of this and that, we have the equality of that and that and by the injectivity of g, we'll get x1 equals x2. So therefore g inverse x1 equals g inverse x2 which implies x1 equals x2. So in this case we are done and now the other case is now assume f of x1 is not a DLP. So again, just like in the previous argument, uh, therefore f of x2 is also not a DLP. And thus, by definition of h, h of x1 is f of x1 and h of x2 is f of x2. And which implies since h of x1 is h of x2, we have f of x1 equals f of x2, which by the injectivity of f gives x1 equals x2 and we are done. This is what we wanted to show and that's it. So just let add a Halmos symbol. And that's the end of this proof. So this proof actually very neatly uh, captures this intuition and basically the proof is an execution of this intuition but this definition of descendant of a lonely point makes uh, the proof like very neat and palatable but i encourage you to look at other proofs also uh, there are other proofs of this theorem available you can just google it uh, and you can definitely try to think for uh, yourself uh, your own proof which is most natural to you uh, and with that i will end this lecture as usual like comment share subscribe i also have patreon the link is in the description below thank you for listening and i'll see you next time